All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, I guess today I'm going to talk about the abomination of desolation. All right, so our friend M Mick. Uh oh, I can't say this word, McMakel. McMakel22, he says, if you're exegesis, and I gotta learn what that word means, <laughs> um, critical explanation or interpretation of a text, especially of scripture. Okay. If your exegesis is, am I saying that word right? Exegesis. If your exegesis is correct, then how got the prophecy of Yeshua in Matthew 24, verse 15, 16 fulfilled? Alright, Matthew 24, 15. And when you there, therefore shall see the abomination of death, desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. That is no Bible passage which can be spiritualized away from its literal meaning. It is clearly given a location, a place, in an important building, and a hot spot for fleeing people. Okay, uh, so first of all, a couple things here. Um, I noticed that you hate the name Jesus, and you replaced him with the name of Joshua, which is the son of Nun. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you've been fooled, right? Because of the wickedness of your own heart, um, you've changed the name thinking that you're gonna get saved by another name all right so that, I mean that's critical man it, it really is all right, Joshua Yeshua Jeshua Yeshua son of none that's not the son of God and there is no other name under heaven no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and that name you know what that name is Jesus is that name alright so that's important it really is alright now you say there's that is no Bible passage which can be spiritualized away from its literal meaning all right. Let's see here. Let's go to the Old Testament. I mean, we're talking about Matthew 24 is the New Testament. Let's go to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff necks. Well, you can't. You can't spiritualize that. You must circumcise the foreskin of your heart. You got to open up your chest and cut a piece of skin off your heart right I mean by that logic you can't spiritual well no you can't spiritualize Matthew 24 because it destroys your doctrine <laughs> you gotta be careful with stuff like that man um, and because look the natural man receives not the things of the spirit right the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God so you gotta be real careful about saying you can't spiritualize that the whole <laughs> The, I mean, the whole book is spiritual. But really, the whole book is spiritual. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. It is the spirit that quickeneth 
the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. What do you mean you can't spiritualize it? They are spirit and they are life. Okay. And look, first of all, let me just, before I continue, let me say I thank you for um, this comment. And this is, gives me an opportunity to talk about it. And hopefully it'll give somebody uh, something to think about. And hopefully they can learn. And really, um, maybe somebody could, could teach this better than what I'm going to teach this today. But obviously... Uh, I mean, every time I hear somebody talk about this, they got it wrong. They got it all wrong, and hopefully, I can sh I can make that easy for you to see, and give you an easy and clear understanding for what the abomination of death solution is. All right. Alone from this Bible passage and a little bit of history, we know a little bit of history. You're talking about man's history or God's history, because there's a big difference. We know that the abomination that causes desolation was placed in the year 167 BCE in the holies of holy of the temple. However, Yeshua, Joshua, speaks around 30 CE of a future event. The prophecy of Daniel has to have a double fulfillment in order to fit your wicked doctrine I, I understand all right now first of all Yeshua again the son of the son of none Yeshua is not the son of God 167 BCE so your claim is that well when Jesus says when you shall see the abomination well this was already 167 years before he was born so Jesus he kinda stupid you know he don't really know we gotta listen to the experts and the scholars cause they went to seminary school they're smart people they know Jesus he did the ignorant apparently according to your doctrine and this stuff is Look, man. I mean, come on. Let's go to Wikipedia. Now, I was curious about this 167 day. Uh, uh, curious in the sense I want to be able to show you <laughs> plainly, easily, how ridiculous this stuff is. Okay? Alright, so uh, let me just start reading Wikipedia. Now, I realize and understand this is not the Word of God. This is one man's thoughts and opinions. This is not a collaboration. Collaboration was a collaboration or collaboration. All right. Coriation, collaboration, whatever. Okay, so this is just it. One man's it, uh, imagination, if you will. Okay, so abomination of desolation is a phrase from the book of Daniel describing the pagan sacrifices with which the second century BC Greek king Antichus for a fifth penis I can't say that word replaced the twice daily offering in the Jewish temple or alternately the altar on which such offerings were made in the first century AD it was taken up by the authors of the Gospels in the context of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in the year 70 with Mark giving Jesus a speech concerning the second coming Matthew 24 15 16 adding a reference to Daniel and Luke 21 22 verse 21 giving a description of the Roman armies but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies in all three it is likely that the authors had in mind future eschatological end time event and perhaps the activities of some antichrist hmm in other words they have no idea this guy has no clue whatsoever 
All right, so let's go Book of Daniel, chapters 1 through 6 of the Book of Daniel originated as a collection of folk tales among the Jewish community in the late 4th to early 3rd centuries BCE. Right, so the Book of Daniel, just a bunch of folk tales. Right, a collection of folk tales among the Jews. At that time, a lamb was sacrificed twice daily in morning and evening on the altar of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 167 BCE. Antichus for Epiphysis, the king of the Greek Seleucid dynasty, which then ruled Palestine, put an end to the practice. He must be God Almighty. That I can, the name I can't even say must be God Almighty. I mean, how else? That's weird. It's a weird God that you got there. Does that look like God? Well, that's a, a, a essentially what this writer is saying that Antichus for Epiphanes is God Almighty yeah, it's weird it really is he put an end to the practice he put an end to the practice that's amazing he makes an end of sin and he makes reconciliation for an equal. I mean, if he does one, he does the rest. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for an equity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, there you go, fellas. That's God. The, looks like he's got half a nose. That's That's God? Yeah, I'm not so sure about this, fellas. I'm not so sure about this. All right. <clears throat> In reaction to this, the visionary chapters of Daniel, chapters 7 through 12, were added to reassure Jews that they would survive in the face of this threat. Oh. So, this collection of folk tales had six chapters added to it because uh, because God or Antichos, Antichus, Antiochus, I, <laughs> God Almighty, not my God Almighty, their God Almighty. Uh, he put an end to the sins. He uh, finished the transgression. He makes reconciliation for iniquity. And he, he brings in everlasting righteousness. Okay? And because of that, they had to add six chapters to the book of Daniel. To reassure Jews that they would survive in the face of this threat. In Daniel 8, one angel asked another, How long the transgression that makes desolate will last? Daniel 9 tells of a prince who is to come who shall make sacrifice and offering cease, and in their place shall be abomination, shall be an abomination that desolates. An abomination that desolates. That's weird phrasing. All right? You're not going to find that phrasing in the Bible. I already checked. Daniel 11 tells the history of the arrogant foreign king who sets up the abomination that makes desolate. And in Daniel 12, the prophet is told how many days will pass from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes, that desolates, the abomination that desolates it is set up. Alright, so hopefully... Uh, some of you 
have enough sense to see how ridiculous this stuff is. Alright. Folk tales? That's, you mean it's not from God? It's just people making up stuff? So you can't really believe it? You can't believe it just enough, right, to where you can believe them, right? It's like Genesis 3. When the serpent says, Yea, has God said? And then he twists what God says to give a different meaning, just enough to deceive or to um, trick Eve into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she did it. And so, also here, we can't believe what Daniel says. But what it what it really says, you know, yeah, yes, Daniel said this. It, it, what it really says is that this guy here was God, and that he made an end of sins. He brings in everlasting righteousness. I mean, really, if you're going to say one, you have to say the rest. Consider the vision. Alright, so if he puts an end to the sacrifices, then he also puts an end to sins. And he makes reconciliation for iniquity. And he brings in everlasting righteousness. There's no way to get around this, man. No way to get around this. And this is ridiculous anyway. You might as well just take your so-called Bible and throw it in the trash where it belongs. You don't believe in it. You think it's a bunch of folk tales. That bunch of Jewish folks, they just came up with these folk tales. I mean, come on, man. Alright. For this prophecy to become true, there must be a new temple in Jerusalem. Oh. And if a new temple of God is existing, then an Antichrist isn't out of the question. Oh, oh, so now we're just saying to hell with everything Jesus did, and we're going to live this folk tale, this fairy tale, and believe this nonsense. I mean, this is ridiculous stuff, man. Eh, I don't know. I don't know how a true child of God can believe this nonsense. If you even read the first couple of chapters of John, you should know this. All right. There was a dispute with the Jews and Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But Jesus spake of the temple of his body. He destroyed the temple and he rebuilt the temple. I mean, you really, you reveal yourself. You expose yourself as somebody that has no understanding of the Bible and has no faith or belief in the Lord Jesus Christ when you talk about a new temple as though it was a physical building you know as if it was what <laughs> uh, you know a castle or something yeah, that's not what Daniel's talking about um, that's not what Jesus is talking about. I mean, this is very clear. It couldn't be any clearer, could it? Jesus spake of the temple of his body. Know ye not? No, ye not? Oh, no. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Okay, I was going to I thought maybe somebody changed the Bible on me again. 
No, it's just I can't spell. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which ye have of God and ye are not your own? I mean, this should be clear for somebody that is a child of God, somebody that is born of God. It should be clear. Jesus destroyed this temple. We're all living in this temple. Jesus destroyed this temple and he rebuilds it. Or he rebuilt it. All right, so we're, and he has ascended to heaven and we're going to follow him when he returns then are we transformed into this new temple that he has rebuilt we go to John 15 I think no 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 goodness sakes John 14 I do this every time John 14 in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also and whither I go ye know the way ye know and the way ye know so he is coming back for us he has promised that it's a guarantee it's gonna happen All right. I said for this prophecy to come true, there must be a new temple in Jerusalem. Jesus already built the temple. It's crystal clear, crystal clear. All throughout the New Testament, and specifically in John, chapter two. All right. Alone, Leviticus, Leviticus sixteen shows that there must be. An antichrist. Well, hey, Genesis three also shows that there must be an antichrist. When the Lord says to the serpent, which is the most subtle creature that the Lord God has made, when the Lord I spoke to the serpent, He said, "I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between." thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel so there has to be a Christ and so also there has to be an anti Christ okay but I'm, you're not I'm not saying you're wrong but Genesis 3 verse 15 Also, you could say the same thing. Also, all right, shows that there must be an antichrist, the goat of Yehovah. Yehovah, the goat of Yehovah. 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 No. Nope. Weird. Weird. You remember when I showed you that uh, Yeshua is Jeshua? Well, Yehovah is Jehovah. Alright. And Yeshua or Jeshua is the son of none. Not the son of God. See, you're too quick to believe what other people say. I want to encourage you to believe the Word of God. Believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. All right. I forgot where I was going, but just right there. I think you said Leviticus. Leviticus, Leviticus, Leviticus. No. Okay. Well, whatever. All right. Whatever. The goat of <clears throat> Jehovah is the end time messiah the goat wait a second i'm confused a little bit 
And maybe I should go to Leviticus 16 and just clarify this here. Alright, let's see here. What's this say? Alright, and let's see, we've got 18 mentions of goat. Two kids of goat for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron, Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one for one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Oh, see now that's interesting. That's interesting. Hold tight to that word right there. Let's hold tight to that one. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the Lord fell, or I'm sorry, excuse me, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, there's that word again. Oh boy, that's interesting. That is interesting. Right? Shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. I like this. I, I like it. I like it. So let's scroll down here. Then shall he kill the goat for the sin offering. Alright, that's good stuff right there. And of the blood. And of the blood of the goat. Alright, good stuff, man. Good stuff. And the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. Interesting, huh? And all their transgression and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. That's interesting, isn't it? And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go of the goat in the wilderness. Well, it's fascinating stuff. And he that and he that let go the goat for the scapegoat for the scapegoat. Man, I like it. I like it. Man, I like it a lot. And he that let go the I'm sorry, and he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward come into the camp and the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place. Alright. This is good stuff. This is good stuff because Jesus is our scapegoat. No question about it. Just as Moses led his people out of Egypt, they escaped out of Egypt, so also does Jesus lead us out of this wicked world. We escape this wicked world. He is our scapegoat. There's no question about it. So that's good stuff right there. Now, okay, let me go back here. The goat of Jehovah is the end time Messiah, <clears throat> and the scapegoat is the. Oh. Oh. What are you talking about, man? The goat of Jehovah is the end time Messiah and the scapegoat is the Antichrist. Oh, you got it wrong, buddy. And the ram is symbolized by the end time Elisha. What in the world?
Oops. In time, Elijah. Um, yeah, well, I'm not sure. Oops, where am I at here? Come on. Yeah, I'm not sure, man. Um, only because, only because Elijah is not mentioned here. And um, I'm trying to understand what you're trying to uh, communicate here. And when you call the scapegoat the Antichrist, that's the same thing as saying Jesus is the Antichrist. Well, if that's what you believe, you're you're on the wrong side of the fence. Whew. And the ram is symbolized by the end time Elijah. The bull is the Alpha Messiah. Alpha Messiah. Only then the redemption plan makes sense. Oh, I see. What? On the devil and the Antichrist, all the sins of the people of God are laid upon. Wow. You should investigate further by the way. There aren't two comings of Messiah, but I believe three to four in the, this end times. Okay. Not two. There's three or four. Or maybe five. Possibly six, but surely no more than seven comings of the Messiah. Now this is just bizarre stuff, man. It's like somebody, to me, this is how I'm giving you, I'm just being honest with you, man. To me, this is a presentation that comes from somebody that doesn't care about the truth at all. Just make up whatever you want. And it, there's nothing solid no foundation for this belief at all and you're essentially making a mockery of the Word of God alright so but I appreciate the comment here because this gives me an opportunity to examine every little thing and it helps me to reinforce what I believe it helps me to strengthen my knowledge and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and maybe by talking about it it can help somebody who listens. All right, so let's get into uh, what the abomination of desolation is. We can ignore this. We can ignore that. And let me. So the first of all, um, you know, I would just want to try to help you in the way that that seemed to help me. Alright, first of all, I mean, to go back, you gotta understand, I just, just, I'm just as dumb as they get. And so, at the beginning, when I was 31 years old, 32, and at the beginning, you know, I was born of God when I was 31 years old, in 19, or I was 2001, excuse me, 2001, September, and so I had heard heard the phrase abomination of desolation not even really knowing what abomination means and not knowing what a desolation means I mean kinda but not really I told you I'm pretty dumb so I had to learn what abomination means and then I had to learn what desolation means and maybe let's see how do I do this let's go this way abomination a thing that causes disgust or hatred and then of course desolation a state of complete emptiness or destruction or destruction a place of complete em emptiness and I think that's really the key to understanding it emptiness alright 
It's the opposite of fulfillment. It is emptiness. All right, so we we see here if you do a search for the word desolation. All right, I could go desolate and oh no, I could. It doesn't matter. I just want to give you an idea here. Okay, your sanctuaries unto desolation, and I will bring the land into desolation. All right, even a desolation and that they should become a desolation and a curse therefore gave them up to a desolation and to repair the desolations thereof in the desolation they rolled themselves upon me what desolations he has made in the earth they brought into desolation perpetual desolations when fear cometh as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind be not afraid of sudden fear neither of the desolation of the wicked and in the desolation which shall come all right just giving you an idea here and there shall come or and there shall be desolation and the city is left desolation and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly desolation and destruction Right, desolations, former desolations, Jerusalem, a, dr a desolation, and this house shall become a desolation. All right, perpetual desolations shall be desolations and an astonishment. Perpetual desolations. All right, Judah, a desolation without an inhabitant, a desolation, and no man dwelleth therein. Now remember that therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment shall become a desolation a reproach desolation desolation forever desolation among the nations Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant desolation a dry land desolation and destruction clothed with desolation a cup of astonishment and desolation um, perpetual desolations, transgression of desolation. Uh, this here we're getting in the book of Daniel here. All right, in the desolations of Jerusalem. All right, and uh, behold our desolations. All right, and I'm going to get back into this, but end of war desolations are determined. Uh, increase lies and desolation. Egypt shall be a desolation. Um, shall make a desolation. All right, their houses a desolation. Uh, wasteness and desolation. Just giving you an idea. So there's not this cloud of confusion. All right, perpetual desolation. Ninva uh, desolation. Desolation shall be in the thresholds. And yeah, she became a desolation how she became a desolation all right I'm brought to desolate okay so now let's go if we if we do it this way we see that there are five mentions in the New Testament let's go back here five mentions of desolation in the New Testament two of them are regarding every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and again in um, Luke 7 or uh, Luke 11 every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation all right these other three mentions three of the five mentions are in regards to the end of the world and in relation to Daniel's prophecy all right here in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13 and in Luke 21 Right, so this is really uh, the crux of the matter if you will is this mention here in Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke tw 21 all right because let's just go over it let's work backwards just for the fun of it let's work backwards in Luke 21 all right it says and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies then know that the desolation thereof 
is nigh. Okay? Remember, these are the words of Jesus. And these are spirit and they are life. Alright? Don't let nobody cloud your understanding. Open your eyes and see. Okay? But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not let him that readeth understand then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house neither enter therein to take anything out of his house and let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days and pray ye that your flight be not in winter for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time neither shall be and except the Lord had shortened those days no flesh shall be saved no flesh shall be saved but for the elect's sake those days whom he has chosen he has shortened the days okay so remember that alright just remember that and remember this Jesus says and what I say unto you I say unto all watch so what he said to them he says to you he says to all of us so when he says these things he's not speaking to a group of people he's speaking to you and I to everybody and what I say unto you I say unto all watch All right, that's important it's really really important just open your eyes and see all right so um, let's go to Matthew okay and Matthew when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoso readeth let him understand then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the sabbath day for then shall be great tribulation so such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be and except those days be sh shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened uh, hopefully you saw it hopefully you saw it hopefully you're seeing it and so I'll go back to it I'll get back to it okay alright so let's go to uh, Daniel right, to Daniel 12 okay and I want you to pay attention now Daniel 12 it, it's the word of God it's not a folk tale or whatever these unbelievers the faithless unbelievers it's not a collection of folk tales it's the word of God it's from God written in the spirit of God all right. the prophecy of old time came not by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost so Daniel in the Spirit of God wrote these things in the Spirit of God these words are spirit and they are life 
And I just want to ask you, man, when you read this, read it with faith. Believe what you read. Alright, so in Daniel 12, of course, is the last chapter of Daniel. And uh, so let's start right here in verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the, abomina I'm sorry, and the abomination that makes desolate set up, Right, from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Now let's work backwards here. Stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Stand in thy lot at the end of the days. And thou shalt stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where, ye, that where I am, there ye may be also. And of course, um, there's a lot of examples to point to, but... Um, you know, this is one, and then of course we could, you know, talk about the New Jerusalem, the Holy City of God that comes down out of heaven. It's a parallel. It's, it's saying the same thing. For thou shalt rest. All right, go thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So, at when this is all over uh, we have our rest in Jesus even now and stand in thy lot at the end of the days that's a new heaven a new earth right it's a new earth and a new heaven all right now think about this yeah, up here you got 1290 days down here you got 1335 days 1335 days so 1335 is a greater number than 1290 right so from the time that the daily sacrifice now this daily sacrifice that shall be taken away that's Jesus now, he didn't die in vain he offered his body as the offering to God he sacrificed his life for us he's the one that makes an end of sin he's the one that brings in everlasting righteousness he makes reconciliation for iniquity he did it and Daniel prophesied it so when the daily sacrifice shall be taken away because he is the sacrifice once and for all and the abomination that makes desolate set up all right, the abomination that makes desolate, the, what's desolate? The emptiness. Right? It's emptiness. It's unbelief. What is more abominable than unbelief in the Lord Jesus Christ, not being born of the Spirit of God? What is more of an abomination than that? And the desolate is not having the Spirit of God. From the time that Jesus lays down his life to the end is twelve hundred and ninety days blessed is he that waiteth and come to twelve thousand I'm sorry thirteen 
what am I talking about? 1,235 days. So this is talking about those of us that are saved. Those of us that are lifted up in the air when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. You see it? So from here to the end of the world, this is all spiritual, okay? That you can't take this literal because we already know that no man knows the day or the hour. But this is simple basic stuff, right? Simple basic stuff. No man knows the day or the hour. But my father only, okay? Don't get confused here. This is very simple. Jesus is the sacrifice. There is no other sacrifice made to God but Him Himself. All right, go and learn what this means. Go and learn what this means. Go and learn what this means. Let's see. Go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Do you know what that means? Hosea 6 verse 6 For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. See Jesus is God Almighty. Jesus made the sacrifice. Jesus has done the work for us. Therefore, God will have mercy on us and not sacrifice. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. So we desire mercy not sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus already sacrificed his life. And so he took it away. And all we have is mercy. We're dependent on the grace of God. We desire his mercy. You see it? So from the time that that happens until the end of the world 1290 days blessed is he that goes beyond the 1290 days to 1335 why because that is those of us that have been saved from the wrath of God that is to come all right it's really it's pretty simple stuff I know it's not sci-fi it's not boogeyman crawling out of the closet. It's not space aliens coming down and fornicating with your wife or whatever. It's not fascinating like that. To me, it's even more fascinating than that stuff because it's real. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. All right. So, um, so let's go back here. One more time, let's go over this again. If you understand that, then perhaps you can understand this. And this is how I look at it, and this is what has helped me. You think about the in your patience possess ye your souls. Now think about that. Daniel 12, verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth. In your patience possess ye your souls. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. In your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. 
in Revelation 20. talks about Satan being loosed and he goes and gathers together the unsaved this is when we're up in the air with the Lord and all the unsaved on the earth are gathered up and they went up on the breath of the earth and encompassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. They, now this is interesting because we're up in the air. Our enemies gathered at our feet. And the unsaved, they compass the camp of the saints about. That means they, they compass us. The unsaved compass those of us that are saved that are up in the air with the Lord. Now, in Luke 21, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed, now where is Jerusalem? Is it that dirty, filthy city here on earth? Or is it the city above, which is the mother of us all? Galatians 4, verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free which is the mother of us all. When you shall see Jerusalem, which is above, compassed with armies, compass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, that means we're up in the air. Our enemy is at our feet. And then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So we know the judgment of God is coming. And we know that the unsaved will be destroyed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. All evil, all wickedness is going to be destroyed forever. We know that. Alright, so when it is the end of the world, keep in mind, uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, they're all parallel verses. And the disciples are asking Jesus, what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Alright? So, you, this, this is the context of what is being spoken of. Alright, that's important. And I can't, I don't know if I can... I don't know if I can say that enough. This is about the end of the world. All right, don't let your mind be clouded with confusion because there are so many other people out there that are confused themselves. Just believe what you read. Okay, believe the Word of God. Believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. Alright, that's important. So, in the context, hold on a second. So, in the context of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 it is the end of the world. It's a description of the end of the world and the things that are coming at the end of the world. So, at the end of the world, what happens? The angels gather together the elect. All right, and our enemies gathered at our feet. This is why we have this mention of then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Why? Because it's the end of the world. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. Why? Because it's the end of the world. 
For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Alright, <laughs> it's not fulfilled until Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Woe unto them that are with child. Right? So, you could you know say hey you know it's tough having a child today and it is it's almost impossible for young people to get saved in today's world because there's so much dis um, so much deception but woe to them that are with child on the day that the Lord Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven woe unto them Alright. Now, all right, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Alright, it's fulfilled at the end of of the world for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled you gotta connect the dots that's it it's that easy just connect the dots is talking about the same thing it's not one dispensation you know one dispensation and then another dispensation don't let nobody cloud your mind all right don't be confused this is simple stuff just connect the dots and realize it's the same thing when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven these things are fulfilled all right let's go to mark 13 all right in verse 14 but when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not let him that readeth understand then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house neither enter therein to take anything out of his house and let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. Now why is that? It's because it is the end of the world. And those of us that are saved are lifted up into the air and the unsaved are gathered at our feet this is consistent all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and of course this is the same thing that we have just read in Luke but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days and pray ye that your flight be not in the winter for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time neither shall be all right so this has to this is all in relation to the end of the world okay now don't let anybody cloud your thinking I already know what they say and I already showed you that they're all wrong they're all deceivers they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they don't believe the Bible they think it's a collection of folk tales don't let those people cloud your thinking 
This is simple stuff. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he has chosen, he has shortened the days. Now, why? Because if God let things play out the way they are playing out now, there would come a time when nobody was saved. All right. And not because of uh, people getting killed. No. Because people being deceived. All right. That's why I say don't let anybody cloud your mind with confusion. Let's go to Matthew. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Except those days be shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect day, for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened All right. why because it's the end of the world and what's happening at the end of the world well what happens at the end of the world is Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we that are saved are lifted up and our enemies gathered at our feet. That's what happens. All right, and so, um, except those days be shortened. So, what's it like leading up to the end of the world? Well, there are fewer and fewer people saved. If God let things play out the way they're playing out. There would come a point where there would be nobody saved. Why? Because of all the deception in the world. Because very few people have faith. All right, and I, I've showed this. I better show it again. I haven't. I don't think I showed it today. Um. Oh goodness sakes! Let's do it this way. You already know this. Um, and God shall, and shall not God avenge His own elect, which cry day and night unto Him, though we bear long with them? I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of God, I'm sorry, when the Son of Man comes shall he find faith on the earth question mark isn't that an interesting question why because if God were to let things play out the way they are the way they're happening now if God lets things play out there would come a point where there would be nobody saved and because very few have faith and things are getting worse and worse because of the deceivers because of the deception because of the lack of faith so when you read this understand 
that the abomination of desolation is the wickedness, if you will, of unbelief, of not being saved, of not having the Spirit of God. And there's coming a separation where that's going to be cut off completely so that there will be no more unsaved people. So there will be no more lack of the Spirit or absence of the Spirit of God. It's all going to be done away with. And this was foretold in Genesis and echoed all throughout the Bible. All right, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden when the Lord says to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel it's echoed all throughout the Bible there's coming an end of this wicked world right what happened Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the serpent beguiled Eve and she did eat now knowing good and evil well there's coming a time when that evil is going to be cut off All right this has to play out this way All right and so there's coming a time when all evil will be cut off will be done away with forever that's the prophecy that's being told here in Genesis 3 and it's echoed all throughout the Bible and so this abomination of desolation is the abomination of unbelief it's the abomination of the absence of the Spirit of God. It's the abomination of not being saved. And because of the wickedness and because of the evil that is in the world, it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be taken out. It's going to be done away with forever the desolation is the emptiness being without God all right and it's nothing more than that you know I did you know you got all these people that are confused and they try to add so much to it and there's really nothing to add to it There's coming an end of the world. The disciples wanted to know, and Jesus laid it out plainly. And there's nothing necessary to add to it. Nothing at all. So it's all very interesting. All right, and. Uh, it's, I, in my opinion, it's very important to teach the end time eschatology and uh, even the exegesis. I forget what this means. Uh, explanation or interpretation of scripture. It's, it, that, that is important. No question about it. No question about it. And it's important to teach the fact that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world there are so few people teaching it All right, and this is all in relation to the fact that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world and I hope I made this really simple for somebody because there's no not much to really um, see other than the plain words that are written right 
So this is clear and consistent with everything that we've read in the Bible before Matthew, Mark, and Luke and after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is consistent with everything that we've read all throughout the Bible. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, that's Jesus, and the abomination that makes desolate, it, that is unbelief or the absence of faith, absence of the Spirit of God. So you got the Spirit of God coming upon us that are saved, and then you got the the lack of the Spirit of God upon them that are not saved. All right, you see that. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up. So you got on this on one side and you got that on the other side. You got the saved and you got the unsaved. Right? And we got the saved because of what Jesus has done for us. He has made the sacrifice for us. And then you got the unsaved. You see that? So from the time that Jesus laid down his life to the end of the world, 1290 days, blessed is he that waiteth and come to 1335 days. That's because when this when you get when we get to 1335, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And I could go on forever on this, but I hope somebody sees it. It's really easy, it's really simple. It's really good. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is a new. It is um, the end of this world and the beginning of the new world that we're putting our hope into, right? We're putting our hope into a new heavens and a new earth, right? New heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness that's what we're putting our hope into a time when there is no more evil there is no more wickedness there is no more death no more pain no more sorrow no more suffering that is what we're putting our hope into and blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand in five and thirty days, or I'm sorry, the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days, thirteen thirty five. Blessed is he that waited, right? In your patience, possess ye your souls. All right, think about it. 